Thank you very much indeed <clears throat> for that very nice introduction, and uh, also for reminding me of what I wrote. wrote you know, when you get to my <laughs> when you get to my age, there's always a possibility that you would forget what you'd written, you know, uh, or mis misread it. In fact, I have to make, begin this morning by making an apology uh, that yesterday and when I was showing you one of the slides about uh, Herod's uh, temples to Roma and Augustus in Galilee. Uh, 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 perhaps we will look for the slide later, but anyhow, I misapplied uh, uh, this particular uh, item in the slide. There were three different things. Uh, an altar with, uh, to Roma and Augustus with the site of Sebaste, Samaria. Thankfully, there was a very astute and very well-learned uh, scholar in the audience, namely your dean, uh, <laughs> <laughs> Professor Attridge, who reminded me that he had a picture of this, actually, and it's from Pompeii. And uh, in, in the middle of the night, I woke up from my sleep and said, Harry was right, actually. <laughs> I, I, rem I remember making this, uh, this slide several years ago and putting together three different items into the one slide uh, to illustrate uh, the Roma and Augustus uh, idea. And uh, the, one, the best one was, of course, this altar from Pompeii. But I did have, an, an, there was also, if you remember, an artist representation of the temple to Roma and Augustus that Herod built at Caesarea and some of the steps at the one in Sebaste going up to the, to the altar, at, uh, at, which has not, not been preserved. So thank you very much, Professor Attridge. That was very, very helpful. I also delighted to hear that I, I was a little too, too rapidly, mo moving too rapidly yesterday, and perhaps uh, didn't, uh, uh, my ac with my accent and my uh, Irish kind of enthusiasm and whatever else, I perhaps may not have been totally intelligible to everybody here. So I apologize once more for that and will do my very, very best this morning. I was also re relieved to hear that we have slightly more time than, uh, than uh, um, I, I had anticipated yesterday, quite frankly, I mis misunderstood the time uh, details. So today, then, I, I will be talking as uh, already, m the title is, I, I, I change these titles regularly. Here I have a Jesus in Context, Galilean Gospel, but the, I think the more appropriate one is the one that Judy mentioned, namely, uh, Pitfalls and Possibilities. I like alliterations in my, in my titles, at least. And in this case, I, uh, that's, that's what I'm going to be uh, talking about today, G about Jesus. Uh, <clears throat> I will also be in the, in the process uh, talking about my own, a little bit about my own book of now five years standing, which apparently is no longer available in the United States. I haven't noticed anything about that in my bank ba balance, but anyhow, uh, <laughs> it's apparently not, not available easily, uh, at least from the, from the publishers. But um, I, I will be drawing attention to the fact that I have uh, given it a subtitle, uh, Jesus the Galilean, and I entitled it A New Reading of the Jesus Story new reading of the Jesus story, because I wanted to make clear that I wasn't attempting to do what my fellow countryman John Dominic did, namely to throw down a challenge to everybody that this is the definitive historical Jesus. Uh, I don't think we can do that, quite frankly. And so I, I, I covered my, uh, my b basis, so to speak, by uh, subtitle, A New Reading of the Jesus Story. And uh, we'll see what you think about that later. So now, let me begin. The fact that Jesus' early life and subsequent ministry can be firmly rooted in the cultural, social, and econo economic and religious environment of first century Galilee gives a specific content to the claims associated with him as they have been articulated in Christian belief. The rediscovery of the importance of the synoptic Jesus as distinct from the more highly theological account of the fourth gospel, an account that has dominated both later Christological debates and a lot of Western piety, is due no, in no small measure to the work of the liberation theologians. Their, their retrieval of the reality of Jesus' ministry within a definite historical and geographical context has given specificity to the gospel claims, which have for long been obscured by philosophical and theological abstractions. With apologies to all theologians present. Uh, <laughs> the Galilean Jesus is not just the presupposition of the Christian proclamation, as Rudolf Bult Bultmann famously claimed, his Galilean ministry is an integral part of that proclamation. And I want to stress that. His Galilean ministry is an integral part of that proclamation. At the same time, it is a challenge to locate Jesus and his ministry more precisely in the Galilean context, as witnessed by the many different constructs of the current so-called third wave of quest for the historical Jesus. At the end of the exercise, one is reminded of Schweitzer's famous conclusion uh, that, uh, that, the, that such an effort or such an attempt is doomed to failure. 
since Jesus constantly eludes our best efforts to track him down. In my own case, I've tried to acknowledge the provisional nature of our best efforts in the subtitle of my book, which I've just explained to you, A New Reading of the Jesus Story. The present talk is based on that work and seeks to explore the figure of the Galilean Jesus as he is represented in the Gospels, informed by a critical exploration of the historical, archaeological, and literary evidence. My starting point uh, is the claim that Jesus' actual career in Galilee informed the early Christian proclamation about him to a far greater extent than is often recognized in modern efforts to separate him from the earliest memories which the Gospel writers have given us. We'll talk more about that tomorrow. While my quote-unquote reading is provisional and likely to be revised in the light of future discoveries, it is my hope that it may aid contemporary readers to understand the Galilean Jesus and his proclamation more adequately for their own lives and ministries. So now, my first uh, section of my paper today is entitled The Galilee of Jesus, Overcoming the Legacy of Distorted Approaches to the Role of, of Hellenization in Jewish Galilee. Now, we've covered that yesterday in a way, and so I will be going back over some of the things I said yesterday and so on. But I hope that it will, uh, perhaps you begin to see what I was driving at yesterday more clearly when we look at some of the, the, the material here. The Norwegian New Testament scholar Halvor Moxnes has analyzed the ways in which the question of Galilee and Jesus has played itself out over the different phases of the quest for the historical Jesus. He thereby alerts us to the dangers of repeating the mistakes of the past, as was hinted at yesterday in my talk. Moxnes exposes the extent to which various 19th and early 20th century European preoccupations and prejudices can be identified in the scholarly debates about both Galilee and Jesus. In particular, the emergence uh, of the idea of the nation state played a role in the manner in which the connection between land, people, and nation in first century Galilee was understood. Likewise, widespread anti-Semitic attitudes were reflected in many portrayals of Jesus, which undoubtedly played a role in the treatment of Jews in the Nazi period, with little or no active resistance from Christian scholars. Thus, according to Moxnes, in the writing of Friedrich Schleiermacher, Galilee was deemed to be an integral part of the Jewish land and its people as constituting the Hebrew nation. David Friedrich Strauss, on the other hand, presents Galilee as different from and in opposition to Judea, the former representing freedom from political and religious domination, that is Galilee, and the latter, Judea, enthralled to Roman power and the bastion of conservative orthodoxy in religious matters. Such a representation reflected Strauss's own position within liberal German Protestantism and his opposition to the state bureaucracy in, in the true spirit of the Reformation ideals. His influence on the ways in which it, it, that both Galilee and Jesus are understood continued to have an enduring appeal to the present day, as we shall see. The French scholar Ernst Renan was to develop uh, this contrast between Galilee and Jer Jerusalem Judea, adding his own anti-Semitic perspective to the question of Jesus and Galilee. I think I have my first slide, I'll allow you to read it there while, we, while I'm talking. Uh, it's um, it's uh, just a few, a few selections, really, from, from Renan's uh, Life of Jesus. And I've, I've tried to kind of underline, I think, there uh, some of the things that will bring out the point I've just been making. His, his depiction of the Galilean landscape was highly romantic and deeply flawed. Relying on contemporary ideas of a causal connection between natural environment and human characteristics, his idyllic picture of Galilee and Galileans is used to establish a sharp contrast between them and their Judean neighbors in the south. As Susanna Heschel explains in her recent book, The Aryan Jesus, Renan, uh, 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 there are copies of that, by the way, in the library, and I think some of you might be quite interested, or in the bookshop, some of you might be quite interested in reading it. Uh, <coughs> sorry, uh, as Susanna Heschel explains in her recent book, The Aryan Jesus, Renan argues that Jesus, though Jewish originally, had been able to transcend Judaism's narrow confines. Is a quotation, after visiting Jerusalem, Jesus was no longer a Jew, <laughs> Renan declares. In an earlier work, he had claimed that Jesus was the first to recognize that the Semitic race was inferior intellectually and culturally to the Indo-European Aryans. Ideas of race were not as yet based on immutable characteristics such as bloodlines, uh, uh, and uh, such as bloodlines. Thus, Jesus' ability to transcend his Semitic Jewish origins, thanks to his Galilean experiences, was seen as indicative of the superiority of the religion that he initiated. 
a monotheism that was less rigid and more mythological than the, either the, that of the Jews or, the, or Muslims. Some of these ideas and the arguments supporting them have had far too long a, a, a shelf life, as we, as we shall presently see. Yet it is important to signal here alternative views from the period. In the English-speaking world, George Adam Smith's historical geography of the Holy Land went through, believe it or not, 25 editions between 1894 and 1931. Smith, a pious Scottish Presbyterian, shared Renan's romantic views of the Galilean landscape, but he avoids the latter's de deterministic ideas of human characteristics being shaped by the physical environment. Purely moral and spiritual forces can overcome the temptations that different regions and their landscapes have to offer. In this regard, Jesus did not succumb either to the more opulent life of the Hellenized uh, lake region, nor the, the lure of the imperial power, which was represented in the district of Caesarea Philippi, with Herod the Great's temple to, to Rome and Augustus. So let me see what we've got here to illustrate that. Well, there's a nice shot of Mount Hermon, uh, and the foothills of that lies Caesarea, where Jesus would have gone uh, as well. And uh, yes, well, I want to move on to this in a moment. In view, of, we'll perhaps go back and leave you with a nice slide to look, look at for a while. <coughs> in view of the dominance of German scholarship in the period, uh, uh, the Old Testament specialist Albrecht Alt is another example who transcended the prevailing prejudices of his time. In a number of articles about Galilee and Jesus, written between 1931 and 1949, Alt used archaeological data insofar as any, any, any was then avail available, as well as his Hebrew Bible research in countering reductionist hypotheses about Galilee, grounded on the anti-Semitic attitudes of his contemporaries. His treatment of Jesus in Galilee comes in a 1949 essay that follows on from a series dealing with the territorial and administrative history of the region from the Persian to the Roman periods. He did not succumb to the temptations of other German scholars, including his own teacher Gerhard Kittel, of engaging in the de Judaization of, Gal of, of Jesus and the Hellenization of Galilee. That was quite a feature of the period, most notably in the work of the G Jena professor of New Testament, Walter Grunman. This latter had published his Jesus der Galilea in 1941, in which he argued that with great probability Jesus was not a Jew because Galilea Heidnischwar was heathen. In an earlier article on Isaiah's reference to, uh, reference to Galilee of the Nations, Isaiah 8.23, uh, just put it up here now. <clears throat> um, in an, this earlier article, Alt had challenged the view that this could be taken as descriptive of the population of Galilee in Jesus' day. Even in its original setting of the 8th century BCE, Isaiah had in mind the whole northern region of Palestine from the Mediterranean to the Euphrates, and not just the relatively small territory that was later identified as political Galilee. Isaiah, he claims, was promising salvation to come for all the inhabitants of the region, Israelite and non-Israelite alike, who had come under the Assyrian yoke in 731 BCE. Thus, Alt, unlike many of his contemporaries, does not agree with the notion of a Gentile or pagan Galilee in the first century. In his opinion, Galilee of itself and freely entered the Judean state as soon as that was feasible, namely in the middle of the second century BCE, when the Hasmoneans, that is the successors of the Maccabees, uh, established a Jewish state for the first time uh, in several centuries. <coughs> uh, and because of the, they joined a freely and of their own, of their own uh, volition, because of the religious and cultural affinity uh, of, of its residually Israelite population uh, had with its southern cousins, links that had been maintained over the intervening centuries. Now that's Al's position. Um, let, let's l just look very briefly at that text that I put up there. You see, uh, in the former time, he brought into contempt the land of Zebulun and the land of Naphtali, namely two of the northern tribes, the two main tribes in Galilee, apart from Asher and Dan up in the north. But, the latter time, uh, but in the latter time, he will make glorious the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, Isaiah 8.23. Now, Alt argues that those three, in the second, in the latter times, refer to three different Assyrian provinces that had been established in, the, in, the re, in that whole region, namely Transjordan to the north and the way of the sea to the south, in the Phoenician territory. 
Now it's interesting, isn't it, when we read, then I put Matthew's use of this text, of course, uh, for Jesus' ministry in Galilee later, and Matthew doesn't quite uh, make the distinction, so to speak, that uh, Isaiah had in mind. Leaving, his reading of the uh, Isaiah text is slightly different. Leaving Nazareth, he went and dwelt in Capernaum by the sea, in the territory of Zebulun and Naphtali, that what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah might be fulfilled. The land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali, the way of the sea, beyond the Jordan, Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who sat in darkness have seen a great light, and for those who sat in the region in the shadow of death, light has dawned. So in other words, uh, my, my understanding is that Matthew doesn't seem quite to have uh, seen the distinction between the distinctively Israelite uh, uh, position initially and the more universal idea, but I think perhaps precisely because by the time Matthew was writing his gospel, he had already, uh, as you recall, Matthew's gospel ends with go make disciples of all the nations and so on. So there's already a universalist uh, uh, trend coming into his reading of the text there, it seems to me. And yeah, we'll come back to that point, I think, later as well. In his discussion of Jesus in Galilee, Alf continues with his method of exploring the administrative history of the region situating the various places that Jesus is said to have visited within their proper administrative districts. Yesterday I mentioned briefly the, mention, uh, the notion of the uh, toparchic uh, regions, different toparchi, that is uh, places administratively small with smaller places, uh, like Sepphoris, for example, as a toparchic capital, not as a, as a major, uh, as a far international city, but more an administrative centre only. And five of these are known for Galilee, according to the literary sources. Uh, five in all postulated for Galilee on the basis of the literary evidence from the Hasmonean period. In contrast to Smith, uh, uh, Alf suggests that Nazareth lay somewhat removed from its administrative centre, which was not, as many take for granted, nearby Sepphoris, but rather Legio, which is situated in the south in the great plain of Esdraelon. In Alf's view, Nazareth was remote, rural and backward, and from his upbringing there, Jesus would not have been inclined to participate in the more cosmopolitan Hellenistic culture of the cities. Nevertheless, his main theater of operation was the lake region. Jesus' main theater of operation was the lake region, where, according to Al's view, the Israelite presence was most likely to have been eroded due to the more intensive signs of Hellenistic culture there. The parlous situation of the older way of life in this region may even have touched villages such as Capernaum and Karazin explaining why Jesus moved the centre of his operations from the interior to the border region of the Lake District. In contrast to Smith's views of simple fishermen, uh, uh, men, however, Alt correctly notes that one of the important signs of Hellenization is the development of the fish industry along the lakefront, something I mentioned yesterday uh, with a mention of Tarakia. Thus, Alt clearly breaks with the romantic views of the Galilean landscape and its influence on native characteristics recognizing uh, the importance of the social, economic, and cultural factors instead. As such, his work is prescient of modern emphasis in many important aspects, as we shall see. So that's my first part, the pitfalls, and gi just give you a flavor, if you like, of the way in which Galilee has been, uh, can be, the Galilee Jesus question can be elided into one question, as I mentioned yesterday, and therefore uh, we can create a Galilee or a Jesus to suit whichever particular interest we have. Uh, Jesus can be, can be commandeered to explain a particular version of Galilee. Alternatively, a, a particular version of Galilee can be used to explain the Jesus we want to present. So these are the pitfalls as I see it, and uh, I, I don't for a moment suggest that I have, have avoided them all, but I've tried to anyhow, and I've become more and more conscious as I get older that we must keep these two things uh, in dialogue, in critical dialogue with each other. Now I come to the major second part of the paper, the Jesus of Galilee returning to Galilee after John's arrest. The Synoptic Gospels all agree that Jesus was returning to the region in the, in the wake of John's arrest, thereby suggesting that he had spent time, some time elsewhere and was likely to have come under different influences. Uh, by contrast, the fourth Gospel does not highlight the Galilean aspect of Jesus' ministry in the narrative, since the main focus is, in that version is on Jerusalem and Judea. Accepting the synoptic viewpoint, Jesus' relationship with his homeland should not be construed as one of undifferentiated affirmation of the Galilean ethos, in which, he was, in which he was reared. On his return there, both family and neighbors deemed him to be an, an errant son, whose wisdom and behavior was not consonant with the familial and village values that a son might be expected to uphold. For example, Mark, uh, three, uh, Mark 6. His return to the region, therefore, was not a homecoming, but a mission with a prophetic and urgent message for his fellow Galileans. Just to 
show up here. Going back to Nazareth, uh, this is, uh, of course, the Mark text, uh, uh, and uh, mentioned there, of course, of, uh, of the fact that, that he's no, he, he would be expected as, a, as one of a son of a family to be part of the, of the village work, and where did he get this wisdom? What was he about? I think there's a very interesting uh, set of questions there. There's also, by the way, in terms of Judy's remark, uh, interesting that the brothers of Jesus are mentioned by name, but uh, we just hear that he had sisters, but they're not named. <coughs> okay. Uh, here, I've just put in a few modern uh, slides just to give you a flavor of Nazareth. This is what's called the Nazareth Village Farm, which is uh, run by, um, by the, the American, I think, Mennonite uh, community. And uh, they've, uh, they've tried to recreate something of the life of Jesus. And actually, when I bring uh, tourists or pilgrims with me to, to the Holy Land, I always visit the, this farm because it does give a flavor, I have to say. I was skeptical initially of the project, and they'd asked me to, would I be a consultant with them. I was a bit skeptical, but quite frankly, I think they, they have captured it very well. And uh, so we have a little shepherd boy here with his... Uh, and uh, there's a, a shot of Nazareth, uh, from Nazareth, rather, to Sepphoris. You can see uh, just at the... Uh, I put my finger, does that show up? It does. Uh, uh, there, there's, um, I'm afraid to touch this thing because... Yes, uh, there we go, there we go, there we go. Let me not... Oh, sorry. Let me... Let me not do it. Okay. Sorry, I really did that. There we go. Uh, so anyhow, in the distance, in the mist, you can see uh, a, a, a rising. That is the hill of Sepphoris, with this, the tower of Sepphoris in the center. I hope you can see it. And it gives you some idea of the proximity to Nazareth. Uh, uh, and, of course, for many people, the discovery of Sepphoris then meant, well, Jesus must have been in there building the, the theater and, and so on, and uh, uh, he may even have visited, and he could speak Greek and whatever, whatever. Uh, so uh, I think we have to... Uh, it was interesting that that issue of the proximity or otherwise of, of Nazareth, uh, Nazareth to Sepphoris was something that Alt and Smith had both addressed in different ways. For Alt, it was not close to Sepphoris in terms of any administrative influences. And that, I think that's quite interesting. Okay, <clears throat> the rest of this talk then I'll be dealing, uh, following the, the outline I gave you yesterday, of the three things, Hellenization, Jewish identity, and the social and, re and economic conditions in the region during the reign of Antipas. These, uh, these aspects of, of life were identified as continuing to be highly significant in Jesus' day. Our task, therefore, is to inquire as to the likely impact of these factors on the actual shape and conduct of his ministry. Was Jesus' method and meaning in any way determined by the circumstances he encountered? My approach to dealing with the difficult historical uh, issues uh, that arise in discussing such questions is to engage in a form of what I call intertextual interpretation. Examining features of the gospel narratives that can, with a reasonable degree of certainty, be attributed to the actual period of Jesus' life, against the background already sketched yesterday, which I'll be recalling again. So it's kind of rubbing two rather different sets of evidence against each other. Intertextual, I use it intertextual in a broad sense of the archaeology, providing us with his own text, if you like. What can we say about the specifics of Jesus' ministry when they are seen within the lived reality of first century Galilean lives? <clears throat> So, so first of all, we I take up the theme then of Jesus and the traces of Helen Helenize Hellenism in Jewish Galilee of his day. Jesus' ministry in Galilee coincided with the reign of Antipas, as we saw. Yet, curiously, the Tetrarch is a somewhat vague figure in the background of the Gospel narratives. Jesus' encomium of his own mentor, reported in an early Q passage, suggests that he is much more impressed by John's ascetic lifestyle than with those who are dressed in fine garments and uh, who dwell in royal palaces. I'm sure you're familiar with that text, yes. Uh, <clears throat> that wear fine garments and are, are in royal palaces. Behold, those who, that wear fine garments are in royal palaces. Now, uh, I just want to kind of... Here's a, an artist's impression of one of Herod the Great's palaces at Herodion, uh, which is, of course, uh, today being the subject of great uh, interest because of the, the discovery of... possible discovery, at least, of Herod's own tomb there. This is an artist's impression of the, the, the tell uh, where the, the, uh, the, the, the um, uh, palace is, is within the, the tell, as it were, and this, down below we have this kind of uh, Roman-style gardens and so on. Uh, Ehud Netzer being the archaeologist. Here, if you can see him or recognize him, this is Ehud Netzer, a good friend of mine, and he's brought me around uh, this place many times. But uh, here, just behind him, you, uh, I think he probably p published this already in the National Geographic. But here is what he claims to be the, the podium on which Herod's tomb was, was, was uh, built. 
Um, you can see it's very finely, finely uh, uh, worked uh, here, and it looks like marble. It's not marble. They didn't have any marble. It's rather some kind of white, white plaster that was put on the things that gives a, a marble-like effect. Uh, uh, and uh, very beautiful lines to it, typically Herodian lines, in fact, like the Ashlers in, that we see as well in Jerusalem. Uh, <coughs> Ehud's hat gets in the way a little bit, but he is a very pleasant man. <laughs> uh, the, 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 that discovery was made about three years ago, as I recall. Now, just last year I was there, and right beside it he finds this, uh, this uh, palace theatre with a royal box. The royal box is, as you can see, boarded up at the moment because there are some frescoes, very nice hunting frescoes in there that had to be preserved. But it, it, it was too, quite surprising for Ehud and uh, also for me to think that within a f uh, less than 50 yards of, of what Herod's tomb was, he found this little, very nice uh, horseshoe-shaped uh, theatre. And Her uh, Ehud's theory is that, uh, that uh, Herod liked to entertain his, his friends and his Herodian friends, and have them in uh, uh, out for a little showing in the evening time, looking, on, looking across to Jerusalem. It is a beautiful sight, I must say, and don't miss visiting. It's not so easy to get to it now because you have to go through Palestinian territory, but it is well worth a visit, or you have to drive around about the Palestinian territory to get into it, but it's well worth visiting, I think, if you get to see it. Anyhow, these slides, uh, I then have a few more as well, I think, have I? Yeah, this, is, uh, this is contrasting the, the artist's impression of Nazareth village, for example, by comparison. Uh, let's see now. Uh, yes, Pompeian style wall frescoes from Masada. Um, again, we talked about that yesterday in various places. Tiberius, I think I showed you this coin already yesterday. Uh, this is not the errant one, the, the, the Roman gates and the beginning of the Cardo as well that has been able to be uncovered. Trouble with Tiberias from an archaeological point of view is that it's a modern city where people still live. So they, it's only when there's some reconstruction going on that they can begin to do some, uh, some digs. Ger Tyson has argued that the saying in the Gospel, uh, what did you go out to the desert to, say, to see a reed shaken by the wind? And here we have in this coin, as you can see, the coin of Herod, something like a reed. Uh, so he, he sees that as a direct example, an, a, an allusion by, by Jesus to, to Herod Antipas. It's a very interesting uh, uh, argument. Okay. Elsewhere in the sayings of Jesus, there are other... So I, I was, these slides were to illustrate really those who are living in, in uh, royal palaces are dressed in fine clothing. So we get, you get, I was trying to give you some flavor, if you like, of the royal palaces of the Herodian period. Elsewhere in the sayings of Jesus, there are other clear references to his critique of Hellenistic style kingship, when he alludes to the rulers of the Gentiles lording it over their subjects, whereas in his community, leadership involves service, not power, Mark 10, 32. When he is charged with being in league with Beelzebul, the prince of demons, because of his success as an exorcist, he replies with two images, the divided house and the divided kingdom, neither of which can survive. Since his own Jewish apocalyptic background would have caused him to see unjust rulers as instruments of Satan, there would seem to be here also an allusion to the internecine strife within the Herodian house in his, in his day, indeed within the imperial household in Rome as well. Both are doomed. It is they, not Jesus, who are in league with the evil one, whereas his power comes from the spirit or finger of God. Interesting, the finger of God is... is, is perhaps the more original, uh, uh, and it, is, it has, it has an, uh, uh, um, an allusion to the, one of the, uh, the finger of, of God uh, in, in bringing uh, one of the plagues against Pharaoh. In other words, uh, from, from, the, from Exodus, namely uh, uh, an allusion to, again, uh, divine power overturning uh, unjust imperial rule. So the finger of God there would be quite an interesting one if that were the original rather than the spirit of God. The suggestion that Jesus visited Sepphoris and participated in the displays of the Greco-Roman culture that might have been performed in the theatre there has won little support among modern scholars. I put in another version of the... This is an older slide before... I showed you one yesterday of Sepphoris, but, uh, but they've restored it. But I much prefer this one in a way because uh, you can see something of the way it was discovered in the early part of the, of the 20th century. And just behind it is that building that we saw from the distance from Nazareth. It's, it's a Crusader period uh, building. Uh, small theatre, about 5,000 or so, I think it was uh, is estimated. And there's a big debate between Jim Strange and Eric, Eric Meyer, the archaeologist, as to whether or not this actually was in the time of Jesus. Uh, uh, some people think it was, others think, no, that it came after the, 
Roman destruction, uh, when, when uh, uh, Sepphoris was changed to Dio Caesarea. Uh, so we wait the evidence. The, the final report on this dig, uh, based on the pottery and so on, needs to be published and will be, I think, fairly soon. At least Eric Meyer's part of it, and I think a lot will depend on that. Some have thought that perhaps that, uh, they, they could detect, some archaeologists could detect an extension, that in other words, it began with a small little theatre like the one we saw, and that then was extended backwards uh, uh, in, in a later period. So anyhow, these are open questions, really. But of course, immediately, some people jumped onto it. Ha-ha, Jesus is in, in the middle of a Hellenistic culture, and he's in there having fun in the evenings, <laughs> even if he was building as well. Apart from what I call his apparently principled avoidance of a Rhodian centre, such, such an assumption, that is, that he visited the, the uh, theatre, uh, would entail his knowing Greek, presumably, uh, a supposition that by no means, uh, is not by no means certain. In, ass in ass assessing the extent to which Jesus might have encountered aspects of Greek culture during his public ministry in Galilee, important to note that he is never said to have visited either either of these two important Herodian centers. And furthermore, in Mark's account, we hear of his journeying to the borders of Tyre, the villages of Caesarea Philippi, the territory of the Gadarenes, the borders of the Decap Decapolis. These are all very interesting uh, terms that Mark uses. Uh, 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 famous um, uh, um, ancient historian A.M. H. Jones said, Mark scores best in terms of his knowledge of, of, uh, of, of uh, Roman administration with his careful, as it were, delineation of these, these terms. Uh, the borders, the territory, or the villages belonging to a particular city. Uh, <clears throat> but one might ask uh, also, uh, it is never said that he ha he's never said to have entered any of the actual cities where Greek language and culture were undoubtedly more prominent than the adjacent countryside. Did he, one wonders, share the Jewish rejection of the urban ethos as described by Josephus, based on the biblical story of the Tower of Babel? Josephus has a, a little insertion in Ju Jewish Antiquities, Book One, about the evil that is associated with cities. It's just a suggestion, at least. In the case of Jesus, these journeys are best understood against the background of the territorial dimension of Jewish restoration hopes and Jesus' own sense of mission, gathering the lost sheep of the house of Israel, as the evangelist Matthew explicitly states. The evangelist Mark, writing some 40 years uh, after Jesus' uh, life, may well have understood these stories uh, differently, namely as a direct approach to the Gentiles, something that was occurring in Mark's own day, as we shall discuss tomorrow. While the borders of Galilee, as described by Josephus, reflect the political realities of his own so sojourn in the region in 66, there is evidence in rabbinic literature of a different set of borders. What is known as the Baraita of the Borders indicates the line to be drawn between observant and non-observant Jewish villages in the region with regard to uh, tithing, tithing and other practices. Now, I, I realize that yesterday I wasn't very helpful in terms of, of uh, uh, my maps. Uh, for some reason, I should have had a map at the beginning. So just in case anybody isn't very familiar, uh, let me just point out quickly here, if you can hear me, of course, we have Isephorus, Nazareth, uh, Tariqia, Tariqia, Tiberias, um, so on, Gamla as well. Now, Gamla should be farther north as well in that particular picture. But that gives you some of the places, anyhow, that we were talking about yesterday. Joe Tapata as well was mentioned, but on the borders of political Galilee. That is the border of political Galilee. But then you can see here a much larger uh, area of the, what are called the uh, forbidden cities, uh, forbidden villages, uh, that on the variety of the borders. So two rather different maps of Galilee from a Jewish perspective. The political map on the one hand, and what we might call the religio-cultural map on the other, and one much larger than the other. And I, I suggest, and uh, I defer to a lot of scholars who know more about this than I do, that uh, perhaps um, uh, the, the basic idea of Jesus' journeys is against the backdrop of this other map to the left, namely based on what's called in jo the book of Joshua, the land remaining. In other words, the land that was given, in, in, the, in, in fact, uh, in terms of the borders of the land as described in various places in the Hebrew Bible, but which was not occupied by any of the tribes, the land remaining. And we have evidence that this uh, land remaining and this, this whole territory, even as far uh, west as the, as the um, uh, well, from the, from the Mediterranean Sea or the Great Sea to the Euphrates, was in one place at least mentioned as the extent of the land. <clears throat> uh, so let me just move on from the, that, that particular one case. Um, yes, uh, 
the notion of an ideal land, a greater Israel, that stretched from the great sea to the Euphrates, is a recurring theme in various strands of Second Temple literature, beginning already with Ezekiel's account of restoration in Ezekiel chapter 47. As a Jewish prophet, Jesus may well have had this broader view of his mission as he traversed the northern region. But he's going to Jewish villages, gathering the lost sheep of the house of Israel. It is on the borders of Tyre that Jesus meets the woman described as Syrophoenician by birth, but culturally a Greek, Helene, as Mark describes her, 7, 30, 25 to 35. Thus, while retaining her ethnic identity as a Syrian, she belonged to the class that participated in the larger cultural ethos. Most commentators see this story as a later creation to do with the beginning of the mission to the Gentiles. Yet this judgment overlooks the realistic character of both the situation and the actors in the context of our knowledge of tire galilee relations and ethnic tensions previously discussed. Far from depicting Jesus as reflecting an open and universalist outlook, as one would expect if the story was primarily intended to legitimate the mission to the Gentiles, he is presented as supporting a thoroughly ethnocentric point of view. The children's food cannot be shared with dogs. His journeys to these outlying regions were not for the purpose of opening up his mission, but rather for gathering the lost sheep of the house of Israel, since there were many Jewish villages located outside the borders of political Galilee. It is the woman who has the, it is the, woman who has the universal outlook, as befits a true Helene. And because of this, she is able to cross, uh, to cross the prevailing boundaries, ethnic, religious, and gender, that separate the two characters, and convince Jesus that Jew and non-Jew belong in the same household, even if there is a definite pecking order uh, in terms of their positioning at the table and their sharing of the meal. Well, that's a controversial reading of the story, but anyhow, I'm sticking with it. <laughs> okay. Even though Jesus did not enter any of the surrounding Greek cities, according to the narratives, he could scarcely have been unaware of the deities of the various Greek cities in, the, in, in their hinterland, in the hinterland, and the powers associated with each. Again, one can find several allusions to, to two of these in the sayings tradition, namely to Pan and Dionysus. The former celebrated at Banias uh, Caesarea Philippi, and the latter at both Tyre and Scythopolis, as we saw yesterday. Both were associated with merrymaking and the outdoors, yet Jesus can emulate them in his freedom and celebration of life. Thus, uh, this is, uh, thus, in his dealing with the contemporaries, Jesus contra contrasts his own approach with that of the ascetic John whose message was dirge-like as he proclaimed God's imminent judgment on this generation. Uh, this text, you're familiar with it, of course. Uh, you note there, we piped to you and you did not dance, we wailed and you did not mourn. For John came neither eating nor drinking, and they say he was, has a demon. So a man comes eating and drinking, and they say, behold, a wine drinker, oinopates, and a glutton. The word oinopates is a very infrequent word, actually. I checked it out. And uh, often associated with, with members of the Dionysiac cult. That's why, uh, Judy mentioned already, I've written an article about this passage. Uh, <clears throat> it's not uh, tax collectors and sinners. Uh, it, uh, I, I think they, somebody else suggested the sinners here was women. I, I'm not sure about that. <laughs> uh, probably the women weren't just the only sinners, that's for sure. <laughs> Yet yeah, wisdom is justified by her deed. We'll come to that tomorrow. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> thus, in, in, uh, that's the, t the text. Jesus likened his own announcement uh, of the presence of the kingdom now as reflecting the joy of harvest time, expressed in the images of piping and dancing. Pan always depicted with his pipes. Here's a, a, an image from Pan with his pipes. The dancer from Dan uh, is found in a, a little uh, uh, emblem that was founded at, at Dan. And you see Pan there very clearly with his pipes and his dancing. Rather big feet, as I can see there from that image, uh, <coughs> a bit like myself when I get on the dance floor. Uh, <coughs> and uh, Dionysic wine-induced wine orgies of the grape harvest were especially enjoyed by women, supposedly, celebrating their temporary release from their matro matronal duties, or at least some, so some modern interpreter of the Dionysiac. But anyhow, here we are, the Mona Lisa of Galilee. Now, as I want to make it clear, this is a later representation. Uh, I uh, found a Sef Villa Sephiroth dating from the early 3rd century. But because there are such magnificent slides, uh, I didn't want to uh, not, not show you them. Uh, it's, I'm told by those who have studied it be better than I can that the, the number of different shades on the, on the cheek of, the, of this lady uh, is ama are quite amazing, something like 15 or 16 different shades of, of, uh, of makeup, I suppose, we would say, in our world. Uh, now, another one is here, the Dionysiac procession. Female wor worshippers bearing gifts to Dionysus, the god of fertility. 
uh, this is on the borders of the same mosaic. So I, I, as I say, I'm well aware that these are later, but nonetheless I wanted you to get a, get a visual, if you like, of, the, of a Dionysiac celebration, which was presumably, uh, even though the villa is much later, we know that the cult of Dionysus in the region as a whole was, was, was much earlier. In fact, it goes back to the Seleucid times. Uh, this is the final one then, Heracles. Here he is our friend, the man who could do the mighty deeds and he just can't hold his drink. Uh, <laughs> a drunken god, Heracles, Mete at the top. Yeah? And then finally, uh, so yeah, well, we come on to that point in a moment. Uh, <clears throat> um, in addition uh, to, to these two local deities, a third, the healing god Eshmoon, Asclepius, was celebrated as Sidon, as mentioned previously. And there's plenty of inscriptional evidence to show that the cult of Asclepius had spread to the Decap Decapolis region also, including Gadara. Jesus' healing activity is well attested in the Gospels, and even his detractors acknowledge his powers in this regard. They attributed them, as we saw, to, the, to an evil source, Beelzebul, the prince of demons. However, it is noteworthy how many of the healing miracles take place in the Lake District. This region, officially known as the Valley, was part of a major rift that runs from Mount Hermon in the north to the Gulf of Aqaba in the south. The frequency of earthquakes here has produced a basalt rock formation that differs from the limestone of the other subregions of Galilee. Not only did this give, us, uh, give rise to a mineral-rich fertile soil, but also to a number of hot springs whose water was deemed to have healing properties. These had, uh, these had given rise to several health spas frequented by the Herodian elite. I have a, a slide here that will give you some examples. This is a, a coin of Tiberius with the uh, Haggaia, the daughter of Asclepius, the god of healing, seated on a rock and feeding the serpent from, from a bowl. Uh, that should be from a bowl, sorry, uh, in this print there. Then Hamat Gadar, uh, Gadara, Kaliroe is farther south, Masada as well. Masada, I think, is there as a Herodian, uh, is on that slide, not, not properly accurate. It wasn't uh, a health spa as such. But Kaliroe is mentioned in this famous uh, um, uh, map of Madaba uh, as a place, and it was a place, of course, where Herod the Great had gone for a, the cure shortly before he died. Uh, I should have also, perhaps, instead of Masada, put in the, 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 the Pool of Pan in the north, because there, too, he, there was healing, healing uh, was attributed to the water, waters of, 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 uh, of the region. Uh, <clears throat> here, as mentioned here, at this spot, Panion is a high mountain. At the base of the cliff is a ca cavern, plunging to an immeasurable depth, enclosing a volume of still water. Outside, we outside well, wells, uh, wells up the springs from which, uh, at some think, the Jordan takes its rise. And then later, Josephus says, the water of the lake is sweet to the taste and excellent to drink. Uh, I put here then uh, this, uh, these two images, uh, one of Jesus, this, uh, a later image of Jesus healing the woman with the issue of blood, uh, and that, that cure was associated with Caesarea Philippi in later tradition, and then this uh, 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 one of Asclepius and uh, Haggai, his daughter. Uh, I wasn't, uh, to my shame, wasn't aware of why, why this, the serpent was, was such an important uh, um, si symbol for the healing cult until I found out in uh, searching, researching it that uh, it had to do with the idea that the serpent re reju rejuvenates itself regularly, and so it was a symbol of, of rejuvenation. But what I wanted to put in there, and what I want you to maybe just have a quick look at is, on arrival, at, this is from a work called uh, Pseudo Hippocrates' work, Airs, Waters and Places. On arrival at a town, a physician should examine its position with regard to the winds and the sun. He must consider with the greatest care how the natives are off for water, whether they use marshy or soft water or such as are hard and come from rocky heights. Uh, uh, the mark text there as well, the many, reference to many physicians. Now, what I found very interesting with that, with that is, if I go back for a moment to the one from, from uh, the water in the lake, is sweet to the taste and excellent to drink. And in another place, uh, in the same description of the lake, I don't have the text here, but Josephus says, the air is eukairos, the air is very good. So the very idea of air and water as a place where physicians should be careful to, to, to find out about when you go to a place are being mentioned by Josephus in, the account, in his account of the lake. So I'm arguing, if you like, that there is a clear evidence, it seems to me, of, of a healing cult down along the Rift Valley because of the property of the waters. And that it's, it's no coincidence, perhaps, that Jesus uh, did some of his healings in that region. Uh, 
Uh, as a physician, he too has had, Jesus too had moved to this region, not however to compete with the professional healers who expected payment for their ministrations, as the story in Mark suggests, nor to establish a healing centre where votive offerings might be made to the God of healing. Rather, Jesus' healing was offered freely and without any thought of re re remuneration, other than the recognition that the true source of his power was the Heavenly Father, whose care and goodness the, uh, the available, uh, was available to rich and poor alike. Um, <clears throat> and I think uh, just one other slide that I wanted to show beyond that. Uh, that's the plain of Genesaret as a, a whole with Capernaum in the distance. Here I just wanted to show you quickly, uh, the, this is the modern day, if you've been to Capernaum you'll recognize it, the modern day uh, um, synagogue. But beside it, th this slide, you can see the very difference. Uh, this is limestone, the, the newer one is limestone, but you can see the basalt rock at the bottom, the foundation. And people would argue that that it indicates that there was an earlier uh, synagogue there and possibly the, uh, the, the synagogue of Jesus' day. Uh, and of course it was there that we see his first, uh, one of his first healing miracles took place, according to Mark. This sketch of Hellenistic influence in Galilee, based on archaeological as well as literary evidence, does not suggest that Galilean society was mixed or that more, uh, or that more open attitudes towards the larger Mediterranean world prevailed there among Galilean Jews, in contrast to those in Judea, as Ren Renan and others had argued. Likewise, more recent efforts to describe Galilee as home of the cynic movement uh, uh, seem highly implausible, especially among the peasant village people. As discussed yesterday, we encounter rather the remains of the older Persian and Greek ethos at some, uh, some sites that had been abandoned from the second century before Christ, uh, and the emergence of many new settlements. Now, on the basis of the material evidence, uh, the pottery and so on, um, uh, indicate strong links with Jerusalem and Judea. It is the descendants of these Judean settlers, rather than the remnants of the old Israelite population, as Alt had claimed, that constituted the bulk of the population in the villages that Jesus would have visited. Galilee was indeed encircled by Greek polis or city-states, but the strong indications are that the new settlers resisted any serious encroachment into, into their lives from the exterior. Now, I, I know I'm taking great liberties with time today, <laughs> taking my time, so can I continue f further? Yeah? Okay, I'll, I'll try to move a little quicker. So my second to topic, if you remember yesterday, was Jesus in a Jewish Galilee. The evidence points to the fact that religious as well as political factors played an important role in drawing the boundaries between various zones of Jewish and non-Jewish settlements, even when, even when some aspects of daily life, such as styles of domestic architecture and so on, uh, were shared. The story of the Syrophoenician woman shows that Jesus shared some, at least, of the prejudices concerning non-Jews. Unlike many of his fellow uh, Galileans who participated from time to time in violent ethnic clashes with their neighbours, however, he was prepared to be challenged as to the basis of those values. Like other northern prophets, such as Elijah, when pressed to do so, he would agree to offer his healing ministry to non-Jews also, succumbing to the woman's subtle suggestion that they both belonged in the same house and at the same table despite the current pejorative classification of non-Jews uh, as uh, dogs, uh, a, a classification that Jesus seems to have shared. This and, and similar experiences in his journeys into the surrounding region of Galilee must have deepened and broadened his understanding of his messianic role, causing him to recognize that at, at his best, as in the case of the prophet Isaiah, his own Jewish tradition could also envisage a place of the banquet which the Lord of hosts was preparing for all peoples, Isaiah 25 uh, six to seven. As discussed in the earlier part of the paper, the de-Judaization of Jesus and the Hellenization of Galilee have often uh, been closely linked in scholarly discussion. Yet it remains to determine what is meant by a Jewish Galilee and where should the Galilean Jesus be located within the spectrum of different forms of Jewish practice and belief of the period. It was E.P. Sanders who first challenged the way in which uh, Judaism had been, uh, had been uh, constructed by Christian scholars largely around the philosophies of the Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes, and Zealots. Sanders pointed out that the majority of first century Jews were not members of any of these parties, but rather held a number, number, uh, held a number of practices and beliefs in common, arising from a shared history that dates back to the return from the Babylonian exile. This is a highly significant clarification, but uh, since Sanders does, does not address the issue of regional variations in terms of the notions of the common Judaism, that he proposes, the question remains as to whether or not there was, was or has been, as has been alleged, a radically different type of Jewish practice in Galilee, and if so, how might they have this have impacted on Jesus' own actualization of his inherited religious tradition there? I'm going to pass over that. One can agree with Richard Horsley, I have a long paragraph discussing Richard Horsley, but we've had enough. 
one, one can agree with... One can agree with Horstel, you'll be glad to hear, uh, that the restoration of Israel seems to have been centred in... I'm missing a light here or something. I just find it difficult to see this. Sorry. W one can agree with Horsley that the restoration of Israel seems to have been central to Jesus' vision. Such a hope probably dated back to the break of the, uh, break up of the David's kingdom in the ninth century, uh, and when the ideas that we saw of the greater Israel may have, may have originated. Is reflected in the Jerusalem-based pre-exilic prophets such as Isaiah and Ezekiel, and further developed in several strands of literature as well, as I said already. The symbolic selection of the Twelve as the centre of the Jesus movement, as well as his journeys outside political Galilee of his day, uh, which we just discussed, is indicative of his self-understanding in regard to Israel. Thus, he could be said to be engaged in what I call an exercise of national retrieval of a lost or dim diminished identity engaged in the exercise of a national retrieval of a lost or diminished identity. Just as the return to the desert of some of the other movements, uh, like the Qumran Essenes and John the Baptist and his followers, is indicative of, this, uh, of their espousal of a return to those, ancient uh, to those ancient hopes as well. Noteworthy, however, is the fact that unlike some of his Galilean contemporaries, Jesus never construed such a retrieval in militaristic terms of conquering the enemies in a Joshua-like campaign of resettling the tribal territories. The significance of Jesus' possible links through, uh, through John with the Essene strand of dissident Judaism, all of it originating in the South, are sometimes overlooked or downplayed. It, it, yet, even, sorry, yet even though his own ministry was to take on a very different and socially radical stance once he returned to Galilee from his sojourn with John, he never ceased to acknowledge John's greatness and the fact that his mission was, that his mission was from God. <clears throat> uh, I therefore disagree with those scholars who see Jesus' so-called lament for Jerusalem as a rejection of Jerusalem and a dis distancing by Jesus of himself and his movement from the temple and its symbolic significance. Remember f famous lament for Jerusalem. Uh, <clears throat> uh, this is uh, the, the reference to, to John, Jesus in Galilee in John's Gospel and then, of course, the, the slur on the Galileans by the Judean elite in the John 7, 15 and 49. In the, in the final uh, section, thus in, a, in, uh, in Jesus the Jewish Galilean, I've suggested that as well as being motivated by Israel's stories of conquest and tribal settlement from the Pentateuch, Jesus was also deeply indebted to the prophet Isaiah, himself a Jerusalemite, whose composite work is highly critical of the triumphalist Zion ideology to which the ruling elite were wont to appeal. <clears throat> uh, because of their opulent lifestyle, because their opulent lifestyle is matched by their arrogant behavior, uh, Yahweh's blessing will be transferred to his servants, who suffer at the hands of the arrogant rulers, but whose form and life, uh, but who form a lifeline to the future, uh, future reward promised to the suffering servant in Isaiah 53:10. This nameless figure's silent acceptance of his treatment at the hands of his violent persecutors, arising from his trust in God's justice, was to provide the model for all those subsequently persecuted unjustly in Judean society, from the wise ones of the Book of Daniel to Jesus and his followers in the first century, Galilee and beyond. Final section of the book of Isaiah, so-called Trito Isaiah, a group described as, quote, the servants, plural, of the Lord, emerge whose lifestyle and treatment at the hands of the ruling elite is modeled on that of the ser servant figure, described in Isaiah 53. Just put that up quickly there. Behold, my servant shall prosper, of course, you know, uh, he shall be exalted and lifted high, and so on. Uh, <clears throat> Do not destroy it, for there is a blessing in it. As the wine is found in the cluster, and, uh, and they say, do not destroy it, for there is a blessing in it, so I will do for my servants' sake. There is the plural, from servant to servants, from the servant of 53 to the servants of Trito Isaiah. And, and another one, my servants shall eat, but you will go hungry. My servants shall drink, but you shall be thirsty. My servants shall rejoice, but you shall be put to shame. Thus says the Lord, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What is the house that you, you would build for me? And what is the place of my rest? All these things my hand has made. And so all these, things, uh, uh, all these things came to be. But this is the person to whom I will look, the one who, uh, that is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. So th these are some, of the, some illustrations of the, what I call this kind of movement, inner, inner Judean movement of the servants of the Lord. This group are to be rewarded by God in language that is clearly echoed in Jesus' promises of blessedness to his own faithful followers. The verbal and contextual similarities suggest that Jesus saw his own group in the light of this movement, 
which is critical to, of the Jerusalem ruling elite, but which still clings to the symbolism of Jerusalem and his temple as a sign of God's abiding presence with his faithful people. Such a profile would explain why a group of Jesus followers, centered on James, the brother of the Lord, emerged in Jerusalem so soon after Jesus' violent execution there. An execution that involved complicity, if not collaboration, between the discredited guardians of the Jerusalem sanctuary and the Roman authorities of the day. The fact that Jesus, uh, uh, that the scribes from Jerusalem sought to discredit Jesus totally, claiming that he was in league with the prince of demons, shows the perceived ties between Jerusalem and Galilee, even when the official guardian of the tradition may well have been suspicious. I think I'm going to move on rather quickly here. The absence of material evidence does not necessarily suggest laxity, ignorance, or indifference to the rituals that had helped them maintain Jewish identity in Galilee as elsewhere over the centuries. As mentioned previously, the Judeans who settled in Galilee and their, uh, and their offspring have left a record of their attachment to Jerusalem's customs and practices in the material remains at various sites. Uh, <clears throat> to be sure, not all Galileans, as indeed not all Judeans, were likely to have been observant by the standards of the Pharisaic piety. Uh, as these were practiced and promulgated by their scribal masters. Yet this should not be interpreted as a sign of a more open or less engaged commitment than the attachment of Galileans to the, uh, as the attachment of the Galileans uh, to Jerusalem shows. It should be remembered that all pilgrims to the holy place were expected to undergo ritual purification before entering the sanctuary, something that can be attested uh, today by the number of ritual baths, uh, ritual pools at the south of the Temple Mount. I think I showed you some of those yesterday. I'll just maybe show them quickly. There's a Temple Mount, of course, uh, ID, uh, representation on the one side, and then, uh, as we see it today, uh, here's a ritual immersion pool for pilgrims, Temple Mount, Jerusalem. Oh, sorry, well, I'm gone out of, out of text here, I think, at this stage. That might, that might be tomorrow, isn't it? Anyhow, we'll, we'll return. Uh, I've gone out of text for some reason. Oh, no. yeah, okay, okay. Oh. More haste, as they say. Well, uh, yeah, no, that was, in fact, that was my last slide, so okay. okay. <laughs> Good. Now, no more distractions, please, uh, in the class. Finally, and very briefly, I'm going to say a few words quickly about what I think about the, the third element I touched on yesterday, namely economy and society in first century Galilee. I would like to have done a bit more on this, but anyhow, here we go. Perhaps we'll get back to it tomorrow. Uh, it's important to focus on, uh, on, on uh, the so some of the socioeconomic situ situations in order to understand what Gerd Tyson has called Jesus' values revolution. Despite the uncertainty about the nature of the Galilean economy outlined yesterday, namely, uh, uh, despite the, that, that difference we saw yesterday was not quite clear, I think an important niche can be found for understanding Jesus' attitude towards wealth and riches in the, in the social stratification that I was uh, postulating yesterday. It's significant that in, uh, that in the lightly veiled references to the Herodian court and Jesus' references to those dressed in fine garments, uh, it is the opulence of the court, court rather than the abuse of power that is referred to. While challenging the relative opulence of the better off, Jesus also addressed a series of blessings for the poor, the hungry and the mourners, in contrast to the woes pronounced on the rich, the well-fed, and those who currently rejoice. But in proclaiming the poor blessed, Jesus was also altering the Deuteronomic pattern of the good prospering and the wicked languishing, a theology that allowed its espousers to ignore prophetic critiques that wealth and opulence were the fruits of injustice, and that Yahweh was in fact a champion of the poor and the oppressed. <clears throat> For him, the Malkuth Yahweh, the kingdom of God, was not just a symbolic statement of hope for the future of Israel, as it had been for centuries. It was for him an actuality now, transforming people's personal lives and social institutions. It's interesting to note how modern scholarship in its desire to present Jesus as a social reformer has given such little attention to the prayers of Jesus, yet this aspect of his career is as well attested as any other in the tradition. And I go on to talk a little bit about the Our Father. Maybe I'll just say a quick word about that. The, I, I, particularly the two central uh, uh, petitions in the Our Father, uh, the one dealing with bread and debt. Between these two opening and closing expressions of eschatological hopes and realizations come two petitions that arise out of the daily necessities of Galilean life, namely bread and debt remission. Each also echoes Israel's foundational experience of Yahweh's care in the desert through the gift of the manna and the bounty of the land for all Israel. <clears throat> 
This reminder of Yahweh's constant care highlights Jesus' confident assertion elsewhere that his followers should, not, should be relieved of all human care and anxiety about food, drink, and clothing. Uh, Jesus' own lifestyle in which the Son of Man had nowhere to lay his head exemplified the trust in God that the prayer enjoins. Equally, a second petition recalls Yahweh's favour in giving them a land flowing with milk and honey. Any social imbalance that the misfortune of some or the acquisitiveness and greed of others might bring about was to be put right in accordance with the jubilee legislations as described in Leviticus 25. Debt forgiveness was an integral part of Israel's ideals for redistributive justice, which Jesus' radical vision sought to reenact, confronted as he was with the increasing social stratification that Herodian rule had brought to Galilee. Uh, <clears throat> well, I just wanted to finish up then briefly. Uh, Gerd Tyson, whose who work I draw on quite significantly here, uh, mentions that uh, in, uh, Jesus' values revolution consists in three different areas, and perhaps I'll just uh, outline that for you very quickly. As somebody whose activity gave rise to the question of his possible messianic status, even outside the circle of his own immediate followers, Jesus had to be quite unequivocal in regard to the expectations people had of him. Thus, instead of advocating a philanthropic use of wealth, as the first one, as even Herod the Great had done on occasion, Herod had bought corn from, from Egypt on an occasion of, a, of famine, Jesus actually demanded that the wealthy abandon their possessions entirely, trust in God's benevolent care of his creation, and follow him, thereby attaining the blessed status of the poor, whose trust in a caring God had freed them from the burdens of anxiety that assailed the rich then and now. Secondly, uh, with regard to power, the second aspect of Jesus' values or revolution consisted in service, not tyr tyrannical domination and oppression, as was too often the case in Herodian Judea and in Roman, the Roman East generally. Nor did Jesus, and thirdly, nor did Jesus aspire to the wisdom of the learned scribes, who for centuries had acted as counsellors of the ruling elites, so graphically described two centuries early, earlier by the Jerusalem namesake Jesus ben Sirach. That is Sirach chapter 38. Jesus of Galilee did, did cultivate wisdom, but it was the proverbial wisdom of the peasants that provided him with the images and paradoxes that were most appropriate for his message of proclaiming the advent of God's reign, despite all evidence to the contrary. Now, I just have one final word of I have some plenty of examples of all those statements here in the text, but I'm not going to burden you with that. Just afterward. In my efforts to articulate more adequately the vision and praxis of Jesus the Galilean, I've been greatly impressed of late by the writings of the martyred El Salvadorian Jesuit Ignacio Elecuria, who, whose writings I became acquainted with by leading a group of liberation theologians a few years ago around Galilee. Uh, Elecuria writes as follows, A reign of God that does not enter into conflict with the history shaped by the power of sin is not the reign of God of Jesus, as spiritual as it might seem. Likewise, a reign of God that does not enter into conflict with the malice and criminality of personal existence is not the reign of God of Jesus. End of quote. In line with this claim, Elecuria speaks of the need for historicization of ideas if they are to have any transformative power in the world of actual things. My understanding of Jesus is that he was engaged in such a practice of historicization of the received symbols and metaphors for God and God's action in the world that were commonplace within his own Israelite and Judean Jewish traditions, but which were largely ignored by their official guardians, whether it be the priests in the temple or the scribes in their houses of Torah study. The result was that Judean society was marked by fragmentation, violence among those who were excluded, and indifference to the needs of the masses among those who had opted for collaboration with the Roman rule. Jesus refused to follow either path, engaging instead in a praxis that challenged both, both polarities of the contemporary ethos. He practiced a politics of symbolic subversion that sought to challenge his hearers to understand the original significance of these treasure symbols, as the symbols for all Israel, rather than of the elite who claimed ownership of them, whether it was ownership of the land, the temple, or the Torah. The question arises as to how this example of critical retrieval and application that took place long ago in Galilee can have any relevance to our contemporary world. Can this, be very can this very local, indeed scandalously local, condescension of God have any global significance, you may well ask. In answering that question for the poor of Latin America, Elecuria and his followers drew on the insights of their, of their theological mentor, Karl Rahner, who has been used very excellently by our other speaker in the feature lectures. Uh, 
Both the reality of Jesus and the reality of the poor have the character of what Rana calls a concrete universal, a concrete universal, one that has, therefore, significance for all Christians, indeed for all humans. Drawing on Rana's theology of symbol and Vatican II's notion of the church's sign, Elecuria saw clearly that the mission of the church is to be, quote, the sign of the ongoing presence of Jesus Christ to the crucified peoples of a broken world. In tomorrow's lecture, we shall explore the ways in which, paradoxically, this remembering and paradoxically universalizing of the Galilean Jesus message may have, may have begun in Galilee also. Thank you very much for your patience.